Dr. Hussein Adie is the author of Abdul Baha in New York. Dr. Adie, for those who are not familiar with the Baha'i faith, why don't we begin by just talking about who exactly Abdul Baha was and what was the significance of his visit to New York? Uh, Baha'i faith was founded by a man by the name Baha'u'llah, who uh, was a Persian uh, man, and he was exiled uh, to Palestine at that time. And so he went there with his family, including his son, Abdul Baha. Uh, his real name was Abbas. And uh, mm, he picked up this title of Abdul Baha, which means the servant of Baha. Uh, he spent almost four years of his life in prison, along with his father and the family, 40? four years. Uh, and uh, eventually, after the uh, a revolution that took place in Turkey, the young Turks, uh, Kemal Ataturk, uh, they got rid of the, uh, the dynasty who was running that country, Ottoman Empire. Uh, and all the political prisoners were released, including Abdul Baha. So uh, he succeeded his father to take care of the affair of Baha'i faith, and part of his uh, plan was uh, to come to America and to meet with a large Baha'i community which was already in this country. The majority of those days he was in New York and uh, he was the spiritual leader of the uh, Baha'i community. Well certainly the seaport I'm sure probably played a factor but how is it that Abdul Baha wound up beginning his visit here in the U.S. in New York City? Uh, New York, no, he, uh, historically, even to these days, are uh, considered probably the most significant city in the world in terms of its commercial uh, enterprise, in terms of its location, in terms of the uh, accumulation of wealth and all that. And uh, it also ha was the center of a, a intellectual and there were writers, painters, and others uh, They were living in this town. And a good number of them uh, has become Baha'i. And that's a surprising phenomenon that what happened toward the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century, there was this uh, uh, desire on part of American to uh, find some new uh, spiritual values. Many of them were tired of organized religion and just uh, activity in the church. So they were trying to find a way of worshiping God without uh, uh, necessarily belong to any particular organized faith. So in Baha'i religion, uh, they found that avenue. And uh, mm, because of the such a large number of them in, the, in the New York, when Abdul Baha got the opportunity and he received many invitation, he decided to visit New York. So how was Abdul Baha received? It's amazing that the uh, at the time that there was no much of media publicity and uh, no way of making a general announcement that such a figure is in America, the amount of attention that Abdul Baha got in New York uh, and in this country was phenomenal. And I think one reason was uh, because, again, New York was a, a sort of a center for all the newspapers and m many of the writers and journalists were living here. And often, uh, what would write was a syndicated type press. Uh, when a woman would write an article about uh, Abdul Baha, the next day, two, three hundred papers around the country would pick it up. So uh, the, uh, the amount of attention that he got from the newspaper and magazine article helped to uh, make him more acceptable by the churches and synagogues and other places. He received so many invitations by the clergy uh, uh, that he could only select, pick up few of them. And in average, they said he would attend between three to five meetings a day. Uh, mm, and in majority of these churches, of course, we can discuss uh, the subject of his presentation often was the, uh, the unity and peace and the station of Jesus Christ and his return and the proof of the validity 
of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, because the big objection those days in this country, especially toward him who have come from the east, uh, that part of the world, was the, the influence of Islam. And there was a great deal of anti-Islamic feeling in this country. So uh, his biggest job was to prove in this gathering the validity of Prophet Muhammad's cause. And uh, in, in synagogue, he would talk about Jesus. In churches, he would talk about Muhammad. So his concept was to bring a, a unity among different religious that he was existing in those days. So you mentioned that he was doing a lot of teaching about a lot of different religions. How did that support what Abdul Baha came to share about the Baha'i faith? One of the uh, concepts that he uh, often emphasized was this, uh, what Baha'i referred to as progressive revelation. That he, uh, he had the uh, suggestion that uh, as humanity mature through ages, there is a new uh, teacher what God would send, an average man, and uh, he would be inspired, uh, and he would lead the humanity to new, uh, uh, new field. Uh, there was a time that Abraham did that, then Moses, then Jesus, and then Muhammad, Bab, and Baha'u'llah. And his concept and idea was that the, the backbone or spiritual values for all these religions are pretty much the same. What often change is some of the dogma and some of the uh, social laws that require for the time. And uh, he believed that Baha'u'llah has come in the chain of the prophets. And he did mention that there will be future individual that would come to guide humanity. So in 1912, Americans are having the chance to learn about this new religion from this very venerable looking Middle Eastern man. But it's something that they haven't heard of before and probably a person that they haven't seen the likes of before. How was it that people became attracted to Abdu'l-Bahá? His outlook was important. Because uh, to many Americans, to see this figure, average sized man, uh, very, rather very handsome and charming with the big, uh, I, th I think they say gray or green eyes almost, which I'm not sure uh, how a Persian had that color, but it can happen. Uh, would appear with his turban and his robe and all that. Uh, it, that was significant. But then he, his deep love for humanity, often you get the good or bad vibration. And I think when people would approach Abdul Baha, get this deep loving uh, instinct that was coming from him. His years of suffering in prison for four years, that I'm sure added to his uh, his well-being and the way he carried himself. Uh, I'm 100% sure, sure that he had a great deal of charisma, because that helps also. Plus, of course, his eloquence and uh, the idea that he would speak in uh, Persian, and there were some eloquent uh, translators who uh, would, would do that. And it's amazing. I, I read a few places that sometime when the translator would make a mistake, in translation, he would correct them. I can't believe that he knew English, but I probably certain words that he realized translator did not mention, he would, he would repeat it. He also had a great deal of sense of humor that would manifest itself often in the, uh, and they said sometime when, uh, in the course of the conversation, he, he would laugh so much that his turban would fall off from his head. Uh, uh, and the, this was the kind of combination uh, that the, I have a feeling attracted many of these reporters and journalists. Your book seems to recount some of the individual interactions as well as the group talks that Abdul Baha gave while he was here in the United States. How were you able to accomplish this? The, the people who came across Abdul Baha, uh, especially those who, had, uh, who could write well, they have put down. Uh, those encounters in writing. And it's such a s great source of uh, and materials to uh, inspire and to read. Uh, there was a woman uh, by the name Julia Thompson, for example, who uh, professionally, she was a painter. She was quite actually a successful painter. Uh, 
uh, make his, her living out of uh, her job, and it's not that easy to, to make a living out of painting, so she must have been good. She has written in detail her, her diary of uh, uh, time that she spent with uh, Abdul Baha. There is another man uh, by the name uh, Colby Ives who uh, wrote a wonderful book called Portals of Freedom. And in that book, he uh, described his encounter with Abdul Baha and how he looks and how he uh, reacts and how the tears in his eyes and the hugging and kissing that he was giving to his friend and follower. That's a fascinating That's account, right? Because Reverend Ives was actually a Unitarian minister at the time he met. The exactly. Master. And actually, I know I have met some of uh, his descendants, and they, they very much it seemed they carry that same spirit of love and affection that their ancestor had. Uh, he, w he was a minister and he was very anxious <coughs> to do uh, things for uh, his parish, but he, he also noticed the uniformity of the member of his parish and he wanted to expand it to other group, to uh, Afro-American, to Indian, to woman, and uh, uh, he, he came across the uh, Baha'i writing and then he heard that Abu Baha is visiting New York he came and visit him, and they said, soon, um, right away, he fell in love with Abu Baha, and he became such a great uh, uh, teacher of Baha'i faith. The, then, of course, uh, there were uh, some painters like uh, uh, Khalil Gibran, who painted Abdul Baha, uh, along with Julia Thompson, of course. Uh, and because of the reputation that Khalil Gibran had at that time and later, uh, that painting has become quite uh, valuable to have. By the way, I have a copy of that. Then uh, uh, a book he wrote, Khalil, uh, called uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, they said the focus of that book is very much Abdul Baha. Some people believe that actually Prophet is the one that he uh, inspired, but he, he mentioned that it was the other book. Uh, I guess we all know that Khalil Gibran was such a big and important figure in American literature for the last hundred years. Uh, uh, there are many other I account that uh, is available, and I have read a good number of them. And of course, Abdul Baha was accompanied by few Persian uh, translators. And, and these people also wrote down whatever Abdul Baha said, and some of them are available, has been published actually. Uh, there's a fellow by name Mahmoud, who uh, recorded all his talk, and later on uh, that, that book and hi the translation uh, with the help of fellow by name McNaught has become a, a book called Promulgation for the World Peace. So this collection of all this material has really helped to, uh, to put my book together and other historical research on the life of the Baha in America. Abdul Baha frequently spoke about peace and cooperation and the importance of unity among all mankind, and yet just a few years after his visit, the entire world was shaken by World War I, and of course in the years since then, the Second World War and, and many other conflicts. As you evaluate Abdul Baha's positions on peace, wh where do you see that there may be evidences that they're coming to fruition? I don't think the, his message as far as the subject of peace concerned unfortunately did not come to any fruition. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the potential for the major calamity was there already. The alliance that was formed in Europe mm -hmm. between Austro-Hungary, Germany, and against France and England was becoming so uh, uh, confrontationalist, and the armies were facing each other that was almost impossible to back out and stop it. Uh, the rise of nationalism in Europe uh, by uh, folks uh, from Serbia, for example. Uh, the Balkan Wars, the independent fighting that uh, was going on against Turkey, uh, the war between Greece and Turkey, uh, and a variety of other things. Uh, and he constantly uh, remarked that unless we come to some understanding, to have some arbitration, uh, we are facing a big calamity. And eventually, you know, the calamity did come, as you mentioned, in 1914 with the Great War or the World War I. I was reading someplace about the, some of the figures as the casualty. 
six, seven million soldier dies, 10, 15 million civilian, millions displaced, millions uh, uh, lost their, all their property and all that. It led to the civil war in Russia that itself in 1917 caused many millions lost of life. Uh, but eventually, out of this calamity came the idea of a League of Nations and uh, the United Nations. Even though we did face another war, uh, uh, 1939, but it seems that uh, toward the end of last century, uh, the, with the formation of the United Nations and uh, realizing that the, uh, the futility of the war, it, there has not been as much international conflict that was at the beginning of the century. Uh, there was, of course, problem in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in, in, in uh, Congo, and other places, but the, the United Nations and the government itself, they begin to realize that they have to come to some understanding. And this, perhaps, is the result of Abdul Baha's teaching and work. So even after the end of World War I, the United States, of course, was racked by great racial violence. We had the riots of 1919 taking place. And even in 1912, when Abdul Baha was here, there was a great uh, climate of racial injustice here in the United States. I'm wondering, did he address this issue? And if so, was he able to speak to any people in power about it? Often. It's very interesting that the uh, at the time that Abdul Baha was in this country, the, the plight of uh, the black, the, the different the women have no right whatsoever. The American Indian were uh, dumped in the concentration camps, and on and on and on. The Jews were persecuted as they were coming from Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, the main theme of most of his, Abdul Baha's presentation, whether he was in a synagogue or he was in a church or universities, was this uh, uh, attempt to rise up the consciousness of the people that unless these groups, the black, the woman, the Indians, and other, get the right uh, to live as a human beings, there will be no peace in this country. The riot of 1919, for example, you mentioned that the, uh, in, I think it was in Chicago, New York, I don't know exactly where it was, but it, it, did, it did cause a waking call for the people that they, unfortunately, they have to suffer more through this for another 40, 50 years to realize that they, they got to face the issue and solve it. Uh, one of the uh, attempt of Abdul Baha in the practical ways was to make sure that in many occasions that he was uh, present, there is a group of minority also there. You know, we often, as a Baha'i, hear about the marriage that he helped to arrange between Louis Gregory and his wife. Uh, Louis Gregory was a, a distinguished and accomplished attorney. I think he was in Baltimore area. And, the, uh, and lots of other occasions that we can go in detail that he would go out of his way to make sure that the minority get their place wherever the occasion was. There was a time that, the, that this arrogant hotel manager uh, would ask Abdul Baha to leave the hotel, not to stay there, because they said there are too many strangers. And by that, probably he meant Persian and, and, and black and others, and he didn't want them to come to his hotel. There was a dinner party that they would not, the, man, the restaurant manager would not allow a black person to come, and uh, he would go out of his way to make sure he participated in that. So uh, by power of example, he was trying to, uh, to show that the, this uh, prejudice has to be gotten away from. Certainly a lot of the time that Abdul Baha was in New York City, he was addressing talks to groups, but I'm wondering, were there any other activities that he was able to enjoy while he was in the city? Uh, the interesting part is that majority of the places that Abdul Baha had visited still exist. I would say at least 90%. And many of them are considered uh, uh, national landmark, or whatever they call it, that they cannot, uh, uh, you know, alternate it or change it or destroy it. 
the Church of Ascension is one of them in downtown Manhattan on 10th Street and 5th Avenue. The hotel he stayed originally, uh, Hotel Ansonia on Broadway and 73rd Street, still is there. The uh, many other synagogue that he, he gave a talk. But my favorite place that I often walk around there is the uh, Riverside Drive. It was close to the apartment he was uh, staying. And whenever he wanted to escape from the maddening crowd of New York and some of the Baha'is who were constantly with him, he would go to this very quiet uh, par park. Uh, it was on the 78th Street. It's a beautiful location. You go down the steps and there's a grass and he would lay down the grass and even sometimes he'd fall asleep. What um, uh, interests him a great deal, and he often mentioned that, that whenever he see these beauties of Hudson River and trees and flowers, he think of his father and all the years that Baha'u'llah spent in prison, uh, uh, not having any access. And sometimes they said when he would describe the plight of his father in the prison those years, you would see tears from his eyes. And he would say, constantly say, uh, oh Baha'u'llah, what have you done? Otherwise, give me the opportunity to come and see all these beauties. That's, uh, another place that is uh, significant for Baha'is and is still, uh, I believe we go and visit, is a beautiful cabin in Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, it's about, I would say, 15, 20 miles from downtown Manhattan. Uh, it, uh, it was a beautiful cabin and a house that belonged to a rich Baha'i. And in one occasion, Abdul Baha invited a large number of Baha'is, a few hundred of them, to come for lunch and share, and he helped the cook uh, uh, to prepare a delicious food and he helped to serve them and is referred to it as the uh, Abdul Baha souvenir. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually we celebrate it or we get together to remember him on the last Saturday of June uh, and it's a picnic and uh, mm, we feel the present Abdul Baha in that location because he slept there, he spent some time in, in, in there. Uh, what uh, right is, is interesting, I don't know why this thought occurred to me. Uh, a day after he gave this feast and this luncheon, the Persian uh, consul general uh, to America invited him to his house, not far from that. It was in, I think, it's in Morristown, New Jersey. And there's a picture of consul general is sitting, Abdul Baha is sitting there with a group of other distinguished visitors. And when you look at the picture, you think of this man was a prisoner in the hand of that bloody government for so many years between Persia and Turkish government. And now he is released. Within a short time, the consul general is honored to arrange a luncheon for him. Uh, so that I thought was significant. As today, New York City, of course, in 1912, a very innovative place for Abdul Baha to come to, a lot of technology that wasn't available in other parts of the country or other parts of the world. Did Abdul Baha have any thoughts about this great technology and the fast pace of life in New York City? He didn't like it much because uh, he, uh, he often mentioned, especially I think a couple of occasions I remember reading his talk. One was at the Columbia University, uh, Earl Hall, and a couple of other churches uh, that he, he said the, uh, the materialism and this uh, modern technology and civilization has gone too fast and has left the spiritual values behind. His ideal uh, culture or civilization was this two has to go hand in hand. And if one develops too far at the cost of the others, it's going to be a handicap situation. So he, he did remark about this subject, but he loved New York. He, the, the, uh, the subways, the tall building, he could call this huge building the Menorot, of the of the West, the uh, the plays, the museum, uh, either on his own or because of uh, his follower, he he was getting around. He goes to Natural Museum of History. He goes to see a play. He had a good feeling about New York, but he often emphasized that the the spiritual values has to go hand in hand with the material values. You mentioned that even those who had never heard about this message of the Baha'i faith, they tended to gravitate towards Abdul Baha. I'm wondering, did he have any encounters though with fundamentalist Christians, 
uh, or other groups that may not have seen eye to eye with his message? Number of them objected very severely, and they even write about uh, uh, Baha'i teaching. I, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, there was a, a minister by name uh, uh, Reverend Bixley, who uh, wrote a number of articles in the uh, New York papers, and he objected to some of the principal Baha'i faith that the uh, and the idea that Baha'is believe that the Baha'u'llah is really return of Jesus and its same station and all that. Uh, even the man who eventually became friend of Abdul Baha, a fellow by name Percy Grant, who was the uh, minister of the Church of Ascension, on the earlier stages he attacked Abdul Baha severely and, uh, from the pulpit and he denied him. But it, it's, it's amazing that the, because I think the subject and the way Abdul Baha approached uh, even the religious leader, he was so loving and with so much humility that quickly it, he would win their heart. That they, uh, uh, he had this great patience to listen to people. And uh, he was so authentic in his relation with them that when he was with them, he was at really at the present dealing with them. And they, in this rush in New York life, they would appreciate something like this. And even would come to them without realizing that you know they are at the present a very calm personality that it means no harm to them and no threat to them. All he wants is the peace in the world and humanities to become united. So besides the religious communities, of course, Abdul Baha was also interacting with the intellectual and the artistic communities as well. Describe how those interactions went. Uh, the main purpose, uh, as far as he himself claimed to come into America, was to attend uh, some peace conferences. There were a group of Americans, uh, mostly influenced by Quakers, uh, 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 religious or Christianity, that they, they were very anxious to prevent the wars and to try to bring peace and unity. They were, uh, for example, uh, a man by the name Rabbi Weiss, uh, the Percy Grant I mentioned. There were two brothers called Smiley Brothers who were very wealthy uh, 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 under Carnegie and others. Th these were the people who uh, seriously were searching for a way of preventing further conflict internationally. And Abdul Baha came. He attended a major conference in a place called Lake Mohang that the uh, they had this conference, peace conference, and they have invited President Taft and others to be a speakers. And uh, through that gathering, and also through uh, some of the rich and influential Baha'is, he had the chance to meet with some of the leading figures of this country, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, uh, there was some rumor that he even met with Con Edison, I'm not sure, uh, uh, and a number of other writers. Uh, I mentioned Khalil Gibran. And, uh, and uh, uh, but the bulk of his uh, uh, his interaction with the writer and intellectual were basically journalists because they were so anxious to meet with him and to write about him. For Baha'is, this 100th year commemoration of Abdul Baha's visit to the United States has a lot of significance, and of course, it's being commemorated around the country in a variety of ways. But your book, Abdul Baha in New York, was written for a general audience. So I'm wondering, what can the takeaway be for those who perhaps are not familiar with the Baha'i faith and yet have the opportunity to read your accounts? Unfortunately, the, the message Abdul Baha did not take hold as much as it should have. So uh, America and the rest of the world had to go through a great deal of suffering to, after 100 years, to more and less to realize that he was right. Almost every subject that he touched upon, it eventually happened. The woman got the right to vote. The minority received certain right. The, the plight of the poor was addressed through social uh, agenda. The unions were formed, because you often talk about the uh, right of the workers. The children abuse had to stop more and less. But it went through 100 years of hardship until we came to that. So I have a gut feeling that the uh, people unconsciously, 
they are in tune with Abdul Baha said 100 years ago. They may not recognize it really, the inspiration has come from him and Baha'i teaching, but they are doing it anyway. So let it be, and that's great.